African violets are in a group in the family of Jesneraceae, and there's another group of uh, plants in the Jesneraceae, is the, and that includes the Gloxinia. It's uh, very common in the florist industry. Um, there's about 125 genera in the Jesneraceae group. Um, they're worldwide in distribution. Um, the African violet uh, is from Africa, uh, but there are other Glox the Gloxinia, which is the Syningia speciosa, the Florus Gloxinia, uh, is also very common in the um, rest of the tropical America, parts of Spain, uh, widely spread across Asia. And Gloxinias were first brought into commercial cultivation out of Brazil in 1785, and it's named for a man named P.B. Gloxin. Again, this is a, from a German colony. Um, in 1825, they renamed the species uh, Syningia based upon Linnaean uh, uh, taxonomy. The Florus Gloxinia is actually a hybrid of two Brazilian species, Syningia speciosa and Syningia maxim, and it was a chance seedling from a gardener in Scotland during the 19th century. So it's got kind of a colorful history. They're typically grown on a very small scale. Uh, most growers get established seedlings from a wholesale distributor. Earl J. Small, uh, for many, many years, was the primary distributor. It's sold for year-round production, typically uh, sold um, around Christmas, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. This is an impulse or a gift plant. Uh, a lot of times it's given for funerals. Um, they get their specialized seedling, their seedlings from specialized propagators. Then the growers can do some seed production. Um, they're typically sown directly on the flat. We don't want to bury the seed. Intermittent mist, uh, 70 to 75 degree soil temperature. Again, this is a forest floor species, so it needs to be warm. Two to three weeks, when it starts to germinate, we cut the mist off because we don't want to um, waterlog the system. At this point, it's, ideally to use, it's ideal to use sub-irrigation. Again, just like with uh, African violets, gloxinias grow best with sub-irrigation. So there's a picture of, of the gloxinia. We start our fertility right after the plants germinate. Uh, standard fertilizer, 75 parts per million, 20, 10, 20. Um, when they're large enough to handle, we're going to transplant them into a two and a half inch pot as soon as the seedlings are big enough so we can start uh, developing the plantlet. Um, this typically requires about two and a half months f um, for this to happen, from sowing of the seed to getting the plantlet. This is why specialty propagators will grow these plantlets because this time is so expensive and so is so long. Uh, you can do uh, some species of gloxinias can be propagated by the tubers or leafy cuttings, but that's typically hobby or typically um, specialty growers, collectors. Again, there is a culture of gloxinia collectors out there that are just as passionate as you can imagine with African violets, where they're showing and these sorts of things. pH, light, well-drained mix, 5.5 to 6. Pretty much the same um, fertilizer, uh, same soil potting mix that we'd use for African violets. We don't want to use any bark, any pine bark or any uh, hardwood bark uh, in the potting mix because we want to avoid, uh, it's just too coarse. and. We typically plant our gloxinias deep and um, fill them with loose soil. We don't want to compact the soil at all. What the grower will do is they'll form a hole in the center so the plant can be put into the soil deep. So a quarter to half inch of the crown is actually sticking up to give it a good um, solid anchor in the pot. But it's going to be low. Now, what we don't want to do 
where this is a picture of a Gerber, we, d we want to plant it high in the soil, but we want to push it down deep as possible. And in fact, some people actually uh, shove the whole plantlet into the soil, um, planting it deep. Uh, so the first set of large leaves is actually buried in the soil. Where with a Gerber daisy, we planted it high. This one we're going to plant deep. Um, you might even want to fold them down. The one thing we want to do during this planting process is not break the leaves. Because if we break the leaves, we're going to introduce disease because we're pushing that leaf into the soil. Newly potted plants, you can put them can to can, but the minute the foliage starts to leave the pot, we want to space them because we don't want the foliage to touch each other on the bench. Now, this is an intermittent intermediate light uh, between like a highlight with a chrysanthemum and a low light like an African violet. We're going to cut this about the middle. Again, too high of a light is going to give us hard, brittle growth, yellow foliage and spotting. Uh, 65 degree night, 75 degree day, a little warmer during the summer. Um, northern growers need to use warm water. If it's cold, we want to use warm water. A lot of growers that grow gloxinias will actually pre-warm their water. And in fact, a lot of Colorado growers typically will run their uh, water system through the boiler room to bring up that water temperature a little bit. I've even seen a lot of growers will run a tubing around their boiler stack just to get the water a little warmer to take advantage of some of that waste heat. They need to be watered regularly, but not too wet. They work good on trickle trickle irrigation, but best on capillary or ebb and flood. Uh, you can use um, sprinkler, but you need to make sure the water is tepid or warm. Constant feed of 100 to 200 parts per million nitrogen works well. We lower the rate in the winter time um, and higher in the summer because how much water we're using. A lot of growers will use um, a slow release fertilizer like Osmocote. But we only put it at a, hundred, a quarter of the recommended rate. A lot of our container grown crops, if we use a nursery f slow release fertilizer like Osmocote, roots are lazy and they'll stay at the top of the soil. So you want to make sure you don't over fertilize with a slow release fertilizer to push the leaves down. If, if their leaves are getting twisted and, and curled, um, that means you're using too much ammonium. And uh, we see this when the soil is cold and uh, there's not any leaching or um, you're watering too much. They're susceptible to boron deficiency, especially in Colorado uh, during the summer months. So we want to make sure to add a little boron to our fertilizer mix. If you're using well water uh, in Colorado, uh, you're not going to have a boron problem. But if you're using surface runoff, from one of the reservoirs in the mountains, boron deficiency is common. Um, HID lighting helps. Um, and a little bit of um, CO2 injection helps your production cycle as well. Some growers will use plant growth regulators on this to keep the plants from stretching too high. Um, but it's easier to control with um, light intensity. Um, this is primarily done to prevent, prevent petiole stretching. Now, the first set of um, flower stalks that come out on an African violet as you're growing the crop, you want to disbud that, okay? And what that does is allows a larger flush to come later, more uniformly. So if you leave the first two or three flower stalks on that first come out, that's the blooms you're going to get two to three flower stalks. But if you pull those, take those out, pinch them out, you'll get a flush of six to eight immediately following, and you'll have a higher quality plant. Starting from seed, large growing types, 21 to 29 weeks, a long time. That's why the specialty propagators. So if you're sowing your seed, most growers will buy a uh, rooted and a small plantlet that's already established to finish. So that cuts the production time almost in half by avoiding the propagation season. And that's the story of a gloxinia.